Orwell practiced these deceits throughout his adult life. The tramps and hop pickers that he met on the excursions that produced his first book, Down and Out in Paris and London, knew him instantly for what he was, a toff trying to pass himself off as a pauper. As soon as we were inside the spike and had been lined up for the search, the tramp major called my name. So you are a journalist? Yes, sir, I said, quaking. A few questions would betray the fact that I had been lying, which might mean prison. But the tramp major only looked me up and down and said, then you are a gentleman? I suppose so. He gave me another long look. Well, that's bloody bad luck, governor, he said. Bloody bad luck, that is. The most pervasive of the myth that he fashioned around himself was the notion that at bottom he was a failure. Orwell was sent, aged eight, to St. Cyprian's, a fashionable prep school on the Sussex coast. There he covered himself in academic glory and in 1916 won a scholarship to Eton. But as an adult, Orwell painted a very different picture of himself at this time. Failure, failure, failure. Failure behind me, failure ahead of me. That was by far the deepest conviction that I carried away. I don't think that Orwell exactly thought himself as a failure. I think he was very skeptical of the available forms of success that he inherited. And I think Orwell was so determined not to identify himself with any kind of triumphalism that he, as it were, erred on the side of a mythology of failure. But I don't think it's exactly failure. I think it's a guilt about um, a personal and family history. As a writer, Orwell was careful to create images of himself that portrayed him as an enemy of privilege. He described his time at Eton as five years in a lukewarm bath of snobbery. But his friends there thought he'd enjoyed himself, and his adult diaries are full of references to the annual Eton Harrow cricket match. In all my researches, I've never found any film footage of Orwell. This is footage of the 1921 Eton War game. We know that Orwell took part. We know that he scored a goal. He has to be here somewhere. But I've been through this countless times, and I've never been able to find him. There was more myth creation over Orwell's initial choice of career. In 1922, at the age of 19, he set sail from Liverpool for Rangoon and a job in the Burma Department of the Indian Imperial Police. According to the Orwell legend, this consisted of five years' uncongenial exile, which he spent ground down by the weight of British imperialism. And yet, serving in the East was a family tradition. When he came back to England in 1927, it wasn't to make a moral point, but with a medical certificate. He caught dengue fever. It was only later that Orwell's feelings about British rule in the East began to calcify into hard ideological commitment. I was in the Indian police five years, and by the end of that time, I hated the imperialism I was serving with a bitterness which I probably cannot make clear. In the free air of England, that kind of thing is not fully intelligible. In order to hate imperialism, you've got to be part of it. He was not very popular in the club, especially with the old established Raj people. And then one day a message came in to say that an elephant was on the loose. When Orwell saw it, he realized it didn't need to be killed. It had already got over its fever, anger, must, whatever it was. But by then he was surrounded by all these Burmese villagers, very anxious that he should kill this elephant. He shoots the elephant, the elephant dies rather slowly and painfully and his bosses were furious because it belonged to one of the wealthy companies and it was a company elephant and therefore should not have been shot. I think that Orwell was trying to work out, if you like, what was 
underneath the kind of life history he lived in his family. Now, clearly, Orwell was born into a classic English regime of a sort of dying imperialism. And I think his work is dedicated to finding out what it was like to be the victim of the regime. Getting onto Orwell's scent in these early years is almost impossible. Not a single letter home survives from his five years in Burma. But there's a faint chance that he could be here in this cine film. Stop. Stop. I can't be sure, but I think that's Richard Blair, Orwell's father, taken in late 1928 the beating of the Southwold Bounds. And it may be possible that somewhere in this footage we can find his son. He didn't get, I think, any support at all from his father. He found it very hard to impress his father with what he was doing. And I think deep down, as most of us would feel, we would like that kind of approval. And I don't think he really got it. We know Orwell was in Southwold in the summer of 1930. Everyone in the town would have attended the local fair. Wandering on the periphery, this lonely figure. He's the right age, he's the right height. I think it's him. Southwold. Orwell's parents, Richard and Ida Blair, retired here in the early 1920s. Eric Blair was 18. He spent much of the next decade here, writing his early books, recovering from illness, on holiday from his teaching jobs. Local people who remember him do so with mixed feelings, as a strange-looking bohemian loner sponging off his parents, and it cut both ways. Orwell's sister Avril claimed Eric hated Southwold. One of those sleepy, old-fashioned streets that look so intensely peaceful on a casual visit and so very different when you live in them and have an enemy or creditor in every window. That was a description of Knipe Hill, the Suffolk market town in Orwell's early novel, A Clergyman's Daughter. Looking over my shoulder at the high street, it doesn't take too great a stretch of the imagination to connect them up. But, as so often with Orwell's life, it's difficult to distinguish between the self-created myth and the reality. For a man who professed to loathe Southwold, Orwell fell in love here, he proposed marriage here, and he had his clothes cut by the Southwold tailor until the day that he died. And echoes of Southwold are everywhere in his work, a symbol of the relationship that he had with Middle England. There is something distinctive and recognizable in English civilization. It is somehow bound up with solid breakfasts and gloomy Sundays, smoky towns and winding roads, green fields and red pillar boxes. It has a flavor of its own. However much you hate it or laugh at it, you will never be happy away from it for any length of time. The suet puddings and the red pillar boxes have entered into your soul.